Good morning, Warren Church of Christ. I would like to welcome everyone to our service today. We're glad to have you worshiping Jesus Christ with us. Welcome to the moms and the aunts, to all the ladies. Welcome to the men. And today we honor and are very thankful to have in our lives dads. Today is Father's Day. I want to encourage all of you, but I want to put a little special attention on those that uh, our fathers, those that are dads, we desperately need men in our country, in this world, to step up and to be there for their children or those that uh, you can treat like a child, right? And I want to encourage you with the Shema that comes out of Deuteronomy chapter 6. I hope this is something you recognize. I hope this is something that you instill in the way you live, moms, dads, people that have relationships with those younger than you that you can mentor. And here's what it says. It says, Hear, O Israel, and I'll expand this and say, Hear, O Warren Church of Christ, the Lord our God, the Lord is one. The, uh, love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, and with all your strength. These commandments that I give you today are to be upon your hearts. Impress them on your children. Talk about them when you sit at home and when you walk along the road, when you lie down and when you get up. Tie them as symbols on your hands and bind them on your foreheads. Write them on the door frames of your houses and on your gates. Thank you for worshiping with us and for being an example for other people, right? Thank you for showing Christ's love to those that you love and hopefully to those that uh, you might feel like you don't love. But these are important things to impress in our own lives and in the lives that we impact. So happy Father's Day, and I, I just ask that as we sing and give back to the almighty, glorious Father, that we thank Him for the, the men in our lives who we might call Dad or who have been like dads to us. Let's pray and thank God for that. God, a lot of us are staying super busy. A lot of us have uh, other things going on, good and difficult things, Father. But God, let us stop, and as, it, as the expression goes, smell the roses. Let us thank you for the simple things, whether it's uh, Larry and Janice Ryan providing snacks for us to start church, or whether it's the people downstairs watching our children. We're thankful. We're thankful, God, for uh, the men in our lives who are like father figures. We pray, God, that today as we honor them, that we will give the ultimate thanks to you for creating them. So God, uh, we pray that you're welcome here and that your spirit fills this place, and that as we worship, we'll do so as one body. We love you, and we thank you for Jesus Christ, and it's in his name we pray, amen. Won't you stand while we worship the Lord this morning?
I had the honor of uh, serving with uh, our teens that chose to go to CIY this week, and um, something that uh, struck me about one of our lessons um, was um, he was teaching on the woman at the well, and uh, Jesus had to travel um, from one place to another, and um, it wasn't custom for somebody like him a Jew to travel through Samaria, but he did. Um, and he met the Samaritan woman at the well. He was, he was waiting there. He needed a drink, and he waited for her. When she came, he gave her that drink. Um, and this was, extremely, this, was, this was extremely far from the norm. This was not something that a Jew um, and Samaritan woman would engage in. He wouldn't even speak to her if he was following normal customs. And uh, the point was made that he knew he would meet her. We know that, right? We know that Jesus knew he would meet her uh, on, that, on his journey uh, traveling through Samaria. And um, it got me thinking um, that he, he runs to us. He comes, he comes to us. He wants us. He wants us in that fold. He wants us um, as his children to acknowledge him and to engage with him. Um, and so I just, I encourage you to think about that and to um, maybe even meditate on that about how Jesus pursues us. His, he is so good and his goodness is uh, for us. It is for all and it is forever.
this time that we invite you to participate in communion as one body. So uh, make your way to a table and uh, before Paul comes up and we will observe that together. It's the time of the service when we, we take these emblems, the bread, which represents his body, and the juice, which represents his blood, um, to remember him. For as he says, do this in remembrance of me. But have you ever thought about blood, about the blood? Why was his blood? Why did his blood have to be shed for us? It's because God designed it that way. Now, one thing you should know about me, I know that there are people in this room, I can, I can point them out, that probably have no problem with blood. I am not one of those people. <laughs> now, the work that I do I think I made it through this week without shedding any of my own. And I'm okay with a, seeing a little bit of my own. That's okay. Large amounts of my own I don't do well with. And any of yours, you should keep it inside you. <laughs> I, I don't want to see it. If I do, then I'll be on the floor right with you. So Leviticus 17.11 says that the life of any creature is in its blood. And our blood is precious. It does so many things. We can't live without it. Other people can't live without it. Some other people can't live without our blood. The Red Cross is always asking for donations to help others that would be in accidents or, or need it for, for other things. And our, we have come so far in medicine that we can take it out of us and we can take things out of it. We can put things in it. We can put it back in us. But we've not come up with anything yet that can replace it. The only thing that we can replace our blood with is other people's blood of the same type. It's that precious. It's so complicated. The Old Testament was full of sacrifices of animals, and they had specific things that they did with the blood. Hebrews 9.22 says that without the shedding of blood, there can be no forgiveness of sin. The point is this. Our blood keeps us alive, and if we donate it, we can even help keep others alive. But only Jesus' blood has the power to save everyone. It cleanses us of our sin and, our, and makes our souls as white as snow. As the hymn says, would you be free from the burden of sin? There's power, power, wonder-working power in the precious blood of the Lamb. He took the bread and he said, do this in remembrance of me. And then he took the cup and he said, this is my blood poured out for you for the forgiveness of your sins. Will you pray with me? Dear Lord, we thank you so much for sending your son that he would shed his blood and ultimately sacrifice his own life for the forgiveness of our sins 
and the cleansing of our souls to make us whole and blameless and white as snow so that we can be with you for eternity. Dear Lord, we also thank you for everything that you give us. And as we take the time to give a portion back to you, we just pray that we could use it here in Warren and across the world to help more people know about the saving blood of your son. It's in Jesus' name that I pray. Amen. We're going to rearrange the order of service for a moment. We'll do prayer, our prayer time. I'd like you to grab a pen because we have several things to add or to update. And I know that we have a lot of prayer warriors in the church that can really help us out and be, uh, be praying and finding ways to encourage your brothers and sisters. So why don't we do this? We'll go through a few of our announcements, and then we'll cover the prayers. So have a bulletin, and we have that on Facebook as well. We have our uh, both the order of service and the announcements and prayer requests on there. But you have it in your hand on the back side of the order of service. I want to remind our ladies group that we're not meeting this coming Thursday Instead, we'll start back up with our ladies' group the second and fourth Thursdays of July. So no meeting this week. We're still topped off from Ivanhoe, our Ivanhoe trip a few weeks ago. And I'm going I'm to be in Kentucky for a couple of days, and uh, that, it's in the same time, time frame as our, our ladies' group. But everyone's invited starting back in July. You see there uh, an open house from Jean, from Jean Grasmick for her new home. And another open house to, to mention would be Nathan. So he... He graduated, and the party is going to be next Sunday, right here at Warren Church of Christ, from 1 to 4 p.m., and everyone here is invited. So Lane Wright's graduation, 1 to 4 p.m., WCC, next Sunday. You'll see there the third thing down for announcements. It says helpers needed for the WAMA VBS. That's true, and we have a sign-up sheet if you're willing to help, but also during the festival parade We're going to be doing some type of a a simple float, and anyone that wants to help out with that, either beforehand or during, there's also a sign-up sheet if you're interested in that. So talk to Liz about those events, Liz Richardson, and if you're willing to to learn more, please sign up, and she'll contact you. Okay, this one, Tara and I tried to work out how to word it, and I thought I'm just going to try to explain it the best I can as well, but for the Caring for Kids Golf Scramble, which is going to be on August the 28th. Every year, we, it's usually on Sunday, and we take a, a group or two. Right after church, we jump in the church van, and we have a lot of fun over there. It's at Etna Acres, just about 15 minutes away. This year, it's going to be on Saturday. So it won't be after church like we've often done, but it'll be on Saturday. They already have, I believe Roberta said, 11 or 12 teams signed up with a maximum of 25. And we hope to, do, to take two teams to support Caring for Kids, in fact, our missions team has already said they're willing to donate up to $200 to cover about half the price of each participant for, the, for golf, up to eight people. So it'll only be $25 for a meal and 18 holes of golf with a cart and prizes afterwards. So please consider going, sponsoring a team, bringing your, your friend, whatever you want to do. But that being said, we have been asked to be a whole sponsor. And our missions team, we could have supported that instead, but we wanted to try to get several people to go. I was wondering if anyone here would be willing to help contribute towards the $100 to make a whole sponsorship for Caring for Kids. They are an amazing group of people who do so much right here in our own community. So if four people threw in $25, or if three people threw in $25 and I threw in $25, it'd be kind of cool to have a Warren Church of Christ hole that we sponsor. So consider doing that. Reach out to me if you're interested in playing or helping out with the whole sponsorship. We have some time, but the, the teams are filling up. So let's help, let's help their fundraiser go well. That leads into an amazing uh, opportunity to serve children in Huntington and Wells County this fall. Okay, now it's where I asked you to grab your pen. It's for me to give a few updates of what's going on. I've asked our prayer team recently to be praying for... To be praying for Kelsey Shaw's, uh, her 
Let's see if I can get this right. She, here's her prayer request from a few days ago. Kelsey Shaw said, can you please add to our prayer list my boss's 15-year-old son. His name is Henry Sather. They, don't, they didn't have a lot of details, but he was in a very bad accident on his farm in Iowa, and they said that uh, his life was in jeopardy. And then today she let me know that they were able, for, for Henry, they were able to put his hip back together. So that eliminated the thoughts of amputation. But she said his face still has to be completely reconstructed. This is a 15-year-old boy. But there's no internal or cranial injuries, but his recovery will take a long time. And we have a lot of people on our prayer list, you know, like Sarah, uh, several other people that we pray for that it takes a long time for recovery. And God can work through uh, short time and long time. He can work through difficult times and good times. And we just pray that God's glory will be seen even as this boy is recovering, right? Thank you, God, that he uh, did not pass. Thank you that he is young and has the capability to recover. But we ask for prayers for him. Another one you can write down beside Henry's name. Uh, This one is, we've been praying for Perry Jane's for quite some time. This is Rick's brother-in-law, his sister, Sherry. He's only 63, and he had been battling health struggles for quite some time. He passed away this week. So we send out our sympathies to your family, Rick. It was uh, coming to that conclusion, and it was somewhat expected, but it doesn't, doesn't help. So we lift up uh, your family in our prayers as well. Uh, we've had Deb Rubel on our prayer list on and off for the last several months. Her health problems are returning again. And on behalf of uh, Susan, it's her sister-in-law, we just say that we are praying for her. We'll add her back to our list. It seems like uh, a few of our friends have bounced on and off. They get a little better and they start to struggle again. So please lift up Deb Rubel. I have a card. This is from Eloise Evans. So. Welcome back, Bill and Pam. And this is from Eloise. And she is 90, 90 and a quarter or so. Or no, she's had her, yeah. She's, she's going strong. And she said, Warren Church of Christ, the card says, but though the, the words are simple, hope you know how much warmth and appreciation uh, come with them. And then she said, in a really small handwriting, it's only bigger than Andrew Fisher's handwriting. She said, my surprise birthday cards and the phone calls were beautiful. Thank you. Thank you. All of you in Christian love, love Eloise. So she had a good birthday. She enjoyed being with her family and friends. She was shocked. Well, she's 90 and she she survived the shock. That's good. So she has a great family. And we tell her hello and we love her too, please. I'd like us to pray for two more things. You can just, uh, well, I'd like you to write these down or text them to yourself, add them to your calendar. Prayer team, you all can be praying for this as well. But we have the Christ and Youth trip, the CIY, which Andrew will share some stuff about next week. We had several adults and several kids go down to Anderson, and they're just not getting back. Let's be praying that God will continue to work through what happened over this past week with them. And as they return, we're now in the thick of late James Christian camp and other camps going on. I know that I have a kid going up today with Misty. They're going to be at Lake James for a few days, so we're praying for you, Amara, and Misty who's going to be a sponsor there. These are opportunities for our kids to grow. They're opportunities to learn and to be future leaders, right? So let's pray that God will move the Lake James campers as well. I believe that is what I was to share, and I ask us to take a moment to pray for those together. God, thank you for the, the things we had that are going well. Sometimes we forget to just acknowledge when things are going well. So we thank you for that, God. For the things we have going on that are our ailments in our body. Or the doctor is giving us news we didn't want to hear about ourselves or a loved one. God, we pray for your countenance and your patience, to be honest. We pray for us to seek your face and to find it. We pray for your glory to cover over all of our pain. God, as I close our prayer and praise time, let me give one more special thanks that you gave us fathers and dads. I pray, God, that for anyone out there that is a father or a dad who's listening, I pray you'll encourage them. I pray that your spirit will guide them to be an example of of what a man is supposed to be according to you. 
So God, lead us in that direction. We pray all this in Jesus Christ's name. Amen. We're going to watch about a five-minute video for Father's Day, and then we'll move to the sermon time. your dad is good at? Uh, working on tools. Nintendo. Working on tools. Laying down pipes. Being a vet. Walking. Walking outside. Um, fixing things. Um, my dad is good at um, helping the town. He mows the tower park and does a lot of other things. Mm -hmm. And he plays his hockey. Okay, what is something that your dad has taught you? Um, how to be nice and he taught me how to, how, he taught me how to, how to be kind. Uh, how to maybe farm. How to ride a bike. How to drive. Sports. How to play Minecraft. How to work on computers. How to ride a bike. Uh, how to play sports. And something in homework that I'm stuck on all the um, wrenches and sockets and how to use them. I even have my own little collection of them now. What is something really funny that your dad does? Um, tickles Adrian at night. <laughs> That's what I would say. Oh, when we were little, he used to play a monster game and he and like to pretend on a monster and he tried to get us and when he got us he tickled us. Uh, this is around. <laughs> yes, this is around. Mm. Let's do the climb on his back. He makes the stupidest faces and the most snarky comments ever. Yes. <laughs> and he tells really funny jokes. On our vacation in the cabin, he kept on closing the trash can. Yes. Okay, so mom was having mom had the trash can open because she was working on sandwiches for our lunch, and he he she had it open. He closed it, and then he kept doing it every time she looked away. Mm -hmm. It was really funny. How do you know that your dad loves you? Um, he takes. He takes a look care of us, and he always makes time for us, even if he's really busy. He spends a lot of time coaching our sports. Because he because helps, he's helps kind. us, he's and kind. he's kind, and he does stuff so we can stay healthy, and he pays bills. Uh, because he is playing and spending time with us. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Because he takes me to camp, and he lets me do sports. Is there anything else that you want to tell us about your dad? Um, that he's hardworking and if he has a task, unless he usually will never he usually will never give up unless it's like one a.m. in the morning. Happy Father's Day! I love you, Dad. Happy, Happy Father's Day. Day! Happy Father! Happy Father's Day! Happy Father's Day! We love, love you. you. Happy Father's Day. 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 We love you. Happy Father's Day. Happy Father's Day.
video, you can now head over stairs and work on your next video. Man, I thought Hanson was only like six or seven years old, but he talked about how back in the old days, Dad used to do stuff. <laughs> Some of us, that's a long, a lot of old days if we're our ages. Okay, so I didn't plan on giving any dad jokes today. I know it doesn't seem like me, but then all of a sudden, my sound guys said they had a perfect uh, sound noise for us if I told a dad joke. So have that prepared, gentlemen. Before, this is a true story, this isn't a joke, but it'll have a good ending. Earlier this morning when Tara and Lacey were working on getting everything set up, there was a lot of feedback this morning, and I heard it. I said, man, that's a lot of, you know, it's noisy. So when I saw Roger, I said, there's a lot of feedback today, and he said, oh, it's okay, it's all positive feedback. <laughs> that was louder earlier this morning when y'all were doing that. There we go. That's one of those chickens you just squeeze. Please don't use that anymore because there's no more jokes. It'll all come across wrong. Okay. What makes a dad proud? That's a great question. We'll have a little fun. We'll have some seriousness, mostly serious. I'll tell you, I'll tell you a story that really impacted me this week. And then we're going to dig into a passage. I got to say this at least four times a year. I got to say, man, I was reading through this scripture, and it's one of my favorite stories, one of my favorite passages. I love God's Word, whether you have a real thick Bible with extra notes, or just the words, whether you have one with the red print that means Jesus is talking, or it's the big letters or small letters, you should really be in God's Word, studying it, and you'll always find these amazing stories that stick out, right? You can hear about them in songs, songs of old, and hymns, you can read about them in poems, you can hear them in the songs we sing today, but you hear a lot that reminds us of our fathers, our dads, and hopefully reminds us of our Heavenly Father as well. But just yesterday, my son Lincoln and I, we went up to be with my father-in-law. Misty's dad invited me to their, uh, they, have, they do a, a banquet for dads. It's really neat. And we got there, we had an amazing meal. Hung out with my brother-in-laws, a couple of their sons. And we had a uh, baked steak with all the extra gravy, you know. I'd go on down the list, they had an amazing menu. It was fun, we had a good time, and then afterwards they asked us to go back upstairs, they, have, they do their meals in the basement, and often they have entertainment when they do these types of things, something simple, it could be a comedy show or someone singing. They said they were unable to get anybody, and they asked if anybody wanted to share father-son memories with a group of 60 or so men in the room. One guy had it uh, planned, his wife had asked him ahead of time to do that, and he shared for Several minutes, different stories. None of them were extravagant stories. They were just about growing up, the impact uh, his dad or his uncle had on him, the encouragement that he gave. And I immediately thought, I'm going to go up and share something. Well, before I did, someone else spoke. And he spoke of stuff that wasn't real big stories. It was just about, you know, my dad would give me a quarter and we'd go buy a pop together. That was his story. And they talked about farming together. I got up, and I, my story was, you know, mine's simple, too. I remember walking to, when I go see my dad, we walk out to the AL8 machine and get a, get a soda pop, and that's kind of my memory, and that told a story about Lincoln and I. And then the next guy got up, and it was just about farming with my dad or getting the pop. That was a weird theme. I don't know why. There's a couple other stories mixed in there. My brother-in-law got up and started talking about a boat that was sinking on Lake Erie with his dad, my father-in-law. That was interesting. But what I found was that almost every response from the thinking of father figures or talking about their sons, they were all, they weren't extravagant. They were just memories of the father figure being around, right? So if I asked you right now to come up, you're not prepared, just come up, talk about someone who was a father figure in your life. You might have one or two grand stories, and that's great. I love those stories, but most of us would think of the simple things. And that's going to be the theme of our message today. But before I uh, get to our main scripture, which is, uh, it's going to be out of Mark chapter 12, and you have a few moments, but I will ask you to turn there eventually. I want to share with you uh, something that, it just touched me. It is a horrific story, but I found it extremely appropriate to tell based on 
partially how it ended. So um, it's actually, I got on foxnews.com, and I just scroll down. I don't often click on the articles on CNN or Fox News. I just like to see what the headlines are. It's kind of like if you're watching the news, it'd be a ticker at the bottom of the screen, right? Does that make sense? But one story caught my eye earlier this week, and it's actually titled, uh, Horrifying Video Shows the Moment an Italian Cable Car Plunges to the Ground, Killing 14 People. Anybody else hear about this this week? Don't, I mean, it'll show you, it doesn't show you the people crashing into the ground, but it shows, this isn't like a movie, this is real life. And it shows, that is the mountain that the cable car, it, it, it got all the way to the top. And something happened and the emergency brake wasn't working either. And it, it, the video shows about nine seconds long of it just going backwards, full speed, and eventually hits something that it, it tears off and it goes rolling into the forest there. And it gave me chills and it really bothered me, it disturbed me, but I read this article, and in this story, uh, where 14 people passed away, it, it then said, and I probably would have led with this, there was one survivor who was untouched. It says, oh, I get, I get chills thinking about this, but a five-year-old boy named Eaton, I believe he, it was an Israeli family that was there, his dad, in these final seconds, was able to grab his son, and kind of, it's, they said, saved by his father's embrace, he was able to close up his son in such a way that even as this thing was toppling down, this boy survived without a scratch. Now, he has some problems. He's been, been able to sleep for several days in a row. I mean, things you'd expect when something this dramatic happens. But his father's embrace saved him. Kind of made me think of a lot of what Paul was just sharing about our father's embrace for us through Jesus Christ and his sacrifice. But this story just touched me, and it has a, you know, so many things not right in this story, but I didn't want to, I, I, I feel like I, I had to share just the way that dad was able to close him over his son and save his life. I think a lot of dads in this room would do the same thing if they had a, to make a decision in an instant. And I just, I don't know, it just, it just touched me. And I think that boy will grow up and he'll have that to think about, but I think, you know, his dad is proud of him no matter what he does, Right? I tell him as a dad, no matter what my kids do, I'm going to be proud of them. And in fact, it's the simplest things that they'll do that I'm the most proud of. So if you have a desire to look that up, you're welcome to. But I know of a lot of people who just appreciate their dads for simple things. And guess what? The stories I've heard from your dads are they're proud of you for not the big things, but the simple things as well. The way you love, the way you treat other people, the way you put other people first. So some of you who I know your dads, I know I've heard Paul talk about his dad, his son Bill before. Uh, I, I've heard a lot of parents talk about people in this room. And the stories they shared weren't the big stories. It was the simple ones. So that's, that's kind of the theme of today. Now I know I've, I've been in a lot of your houses. And I always like to look at your refrigerators. I usually like to look because I like to look and see if you have your newsletters on the fridge. It's kind of a small thing I like to check out. Um, back in, there's all kinds of jokes on the, about the people that put their Bibles on the tables when the preacher's coming by. I don't, I don't look for Bibles. I don't, you know, there's a great joke there. But I just like to look and see what your refrigerators look like. And I know a lot of people uh, in this room have either downsized their own homes or helped downsize their parents' homes. One of, my, one of the coolest things I like about Gerald and Ruth was about 10 or 12 years ago, they downsized from Markle with all kinds of stuff. Can you imagine the stuff that they had in the ministry over 40 or 50 years? And they intentionally downsized to get to Heritage Point, and they did that intentionally so their children wouldn't have to worry about stuff when they, when they were older. Uh, but if you, You'll find all kinds of things that moms and, and dads have. So whether it's things that have been on the refrigerator or currently are on the refrigerator, or things that you've accumulated and you've put into many, many boxes. Anybody have their kids' stuff in box after box after box? Maybe you've passed it on to your kids by now. Old report cards, drawings, awards or trophies. Or what's cool about our size town is a few times a year you might find your kid in the tab or the Warren Weekly or the church newsletter, right? I'm the same way with my kids. I, I proudly display my kids' accomplishments on the refrigerator or I print stuff off I get from the school. 
and then Misty and, I, Misty and I store them away in folders and in drawers. And this kind of reminds me of uh, the parable and, and the stories that we'll share today. That God, you know, he thinks, he thinks of us as his children. We are God's. We are heirs with Christ. I love that title. And our parents, they love us, and they care about us in the small things. And our Father in heaven, he remembers uh, and treasures up. Yes, yes, he loves the big things. The martyrs who have died for him, the day we give our life to Christ through our baptism, uh, the people who dedicate their lives in ministry or who are in missions work and sacrificing so much, the rich person who gives a lot of money for a hospital or for a church, the musicians who have amazing gifts, who help lead people towards him. Those are big things. They have a special place on God's fridge. <laughs> but kind of what I want us to remember is God also remembers and treasures the little things. And I say little things, they're little down here, but they're big to God. Now, uh, I looked through an old lookout, and I found all kinds of stories and sayings about dads. And uh, the author of this lookout, he started sharing about, um, well, similar to this, how we don't have to think about all the big things to make our, our Heavenly Father proud. Right? Just like your dad didn't, you know, it wasn't the big things, it was the simple things. And in this story, uh, the author of this Lookout article, he talks about people whose names, I probably wouldn't have told you where they were or which book of the Bible they were. And I'm pretty good with Bible trivia. If I'm playing Bible trivia, like categories, the Bible version, I win a lot of times. But these two names escaped me. Uh, Shifra and Pua, I'm probably not going to come close to saying their names right. Maybe a few of you know who I'm talking about. Uh, if their names don't ring a bell, it says, don't worry. It's in a tiny fragment of a story in Exodus. Just seven verses. It tells us that these Hebrew midwives disobeyed Pharaoh's orders to kill all newborn Hebrew boys. Shifra and Pua, quote, Exodus 1.17, did not do what the king of Egypt had told them to do. They let the boys live. And then it wraps up and says, the father applauded them, the father, God, applauded them for this. Their courageous act of civil disobedience served his plan, right? Who survived that? Moses. I like that story. And then I got thinking, who are, some other, who are some other characters who are very minor, who don't get attention? I've got a few I like. But then one dawned on me. Who's the one, well, who's the, who's the most consequential, consequential evangelist in the New Testament, it's the Apostle Paul, right? Wrote so much of our New Testament. We know that the Apostle Paul, uh, as the one, Acts 9.15 says, he was called as God's chosen instrument to proclaim God's name to the Gentiles, you and I, and to their kings. Okay, awesome. That's a big moment, the Apostle Paul. But how did the Apostle Paul come to be the Apostle Paul instead of the murderer Saul? Well, it was because of a faithful man named Ananias. Ananias, his mission seems pretty trivial. It's just a quick mention. It's, a sm it's so small compared to the Apostle Paul's, but it's to take a walk down Straight Street, it says. Find Paul. Place your hands on him and pray for restoration of his sight. Pretty nerve-wracking when you think of Saul as a murderer before he becomes Paul the Evangelist. But Paul's a king size, you know, story where he writes half a third of the New Testament or more. All this, this world changing mission, dependent on Ananias' seemingly insignificant act of obedience. A small thing. Okay, I've shared some stories from Exodus and about Ananias. Things that you have to do in a moment, like cover a child from danger. Being faithful, being obedient, doing these things that seem small and insignificant. You know, I think Ananias reminds me that what I might think seems trivial or small down here is very important and has eternal consequences in heaven, right? So what makes a dad proud? There are so many stories in our Bibles or in our own lives that show us the little things that have a huge impact. 
You could take, uh, let me give one more story before we dig into Mark 12. I was thinking about the feeding of the 5,000. Or we often think of that as 5,000 men, so probably 15 or 20,000 people, right? In this story, who's the main characters? Jesus and the disciples, right? It says Jesus feeds the 5,000. That's in John 6. We naturally focus on the end of the story where uh, Jesus, you know, the miracle, there's a feast, everyone has bread and fish. But if you take another look at the simplicity of John chapter 6, you have uh, the story say, this is Andrew talking to Jesus, here is a boy with, with five small barley loaves and two small fish, right? So this boy has his lunch amongst five to 15,000 people. And I would say it's safe to say in this story in John 6 that Andrew doesn't go and commandeer the, the lunch sack that the little boy has, right? So Jesus, he probably says something like, does anybody have any ideas of feeding the multitude? I don't know what he says. But that nameless boy steps up, and Jesus used his tiny gift of a few fish, of a few pieces of bread, to feed thousands and thousands. And I think that made Jesus proud that that little boy helped, Right? Now, no story in the Bible quite sums up what I, I have behind me like one of my new favorite stories. Okay? So, God treasures the little things even more than the big things. And nothing sums this up like the little things that were offered by the widow that Jesus observed in the story of Mark chapter 12. And we'll call this uh, her humble offering. So grab your Bible. In fact, this is our main scripture text today. Jesus, this happened a lot. He noticed something that no one else was picking up on. I hope we kind of think that way too. Don't just always follow. Don't just do exactly what you're supposed to do. Step back and see what's going on. Think for yourself. And Jesus was doing that right here. So my, my sermon title, as you're turning to Mark chapter 12, my sermon title one last time is, What Makes a Dad Proud? I think Mark chapter 12, verses 41, 42, 43, 44, it's a very short story, but I think it gives an, an amazing answer. Mark tells us that Jesus stopped to watch the crowd. He was watching them put their money into the temple treasure, treasury. Here's what it says. Jesus sat down opposite the place where the offerings were put and he watched the crowd. He watched the crowd putting their money into the temple treasury. Many rich people threw in large amounts. But a poor widow came and put in two very small copper coins worth only a few cents. Calling his disciples to him, Jesus said, Truly I tell you, this poor widow has put more into the treasury than all the others. They gave out of their wealth, but she out of her poverty. She out of her poverty put in everything, all she had to live on. I like that story, and Jesus is not saying anything bad about those that gave a lot. He is wanting us to have the perspective that he has. And a lot of his parables that turn our thinking upside down, this is a great real-life visual. In fact, listen to the way that the message, the message captures Jesus' words perfectly. All the others gave what they'll never miss. Right? That's a lot of us. All the others gave what they'll never miss. She gave her all. And like a good dad, God, Jesus, bragged on his kid. Right? Anybody else a humble brag, dad? You got something to share? And it's killing you. You really want to share it? That's called the humble brag. Jesus is showing us a perfect example of what he's proud of. The widow gave her all. The temple treasury, the, to, the, to the other worshipers to the rest of the world, it was just a fraction of a penny. Right now, if I asked for a, a dollar, everyone would reach in their pocket and give it to me, and they wouldn't think twice, right? 
Well, that'd make me about $100 right now. Maybe I should try that. I don't know. No, I'm just joking. We could get over a dollar, right? In fact, uh, a dollar is so insignificant, I should have done more. Just, I think it was yesterday or two days ago, I, for the 20th time in my marriage, lost my ring. Anybody else? Is anybody else here a ring loser? Yeah. My ring always comes back around. Somehow I've managed to keep this thing for my 13 or 14 years of marriage. I lost it for about two months when we went to Virginia Beach. When we got back, I couldn't find it. All right? And then just yesterday, I was actually wrestling with my kids, as one of them said on the video. And uh, something fell over the edge of the bed, so Ren said, raise the bed up, Dad, and I'll, I'll grab it. When she came back up, she was smiling from ear to ear, and my ring that I hadn't worn in two months, she was holding it in her hand. I gave her the biggest hug ever, and I walked over to the dresser and grabbed a dollar and gave it to her. I could have given her a $1,000. I was so happy. But I just gave her one, because one is no big deal. Right? That's what a lot of us feel like. But in this story, to the other worshipers, to those that were watching the same thing that Jesus was watching, they weren't picking up on it. But to the God of all creation, what that woman was doing meant everything. That's what made him proud. He stopped everything to take notice. And I bet you there's a lot more stories like that that we don't know of. But he took notice, and he even immortalized this woman in his autobiography. Right? That's what makes him proud. I love that. In Mark chapter 12, verses 41 through 44, it's an incredible story. And this is what I want us to remember. What the world overlooks... God exalts. Does that make sense? So to our dads and to everyone listening, what the world overlooks, God exalts. Did you hear what happened in that video? There weren't a lot of uh, huge stories that were shared by the kids. What did they share? The everyday life. Lucy mentioned camping with her dad. Or some other kids, they were talking about, uh, he coaches my sports. I think Claire said that. My dad loves me. He cares about me. The simple things that we do over and over, dads. What the world overlooks, God, children, and in this instance, one and the same, they notice. So what do we have here? I'm going to use a word much bigger than what I usually use. But the generous, this is what I got from a commentary, the generous widow in this story is an archetype of all who are overlooked by the world. But what the world overlooks, God notices. That's kind of the summary. In fact, uh, it was God's idea to put this act of service on his fridge. I already mentioned that. It's, an, it's a story in the Bible. The Father does the same. He does the same with us. He does the same with us when we do things for the right, the right things for the right reasons. It's only when we start uh, thinking that we... Uh, that we're a big deal, or, or that what we're doing is what pleases God. It's not what we do, it's that we give our faith to Jesus that pleases God. But the small things are big things to the Father. But remember, so let me say it again, I'm not saying that our works save us. I'm not saying that God needs you to carry out His plan. We need God, not the other way around. That's the only way it goes. But when we help, when we help God, when we're living the right way, our, it brings our Father joy it makes him proud. So men, dads, uncles, teachers, moms, aunts, grandmas, whatever we are, mentors, we're all serving God. How do you make him proud in these roles? What will our children say about us someday? Uh, I hope it's similar to this. I, I printed this out a few years ago and was waiting for a good time to use it. Now where did I put it? Here it is. It's from a Sermon Central article titled, Ray Ortland's Unforgettable Lessons on Fatherhood. And he's a, a minister, and he's a minister's son. Those two things don't always, go, don't, don't always go well together. But my favorite words in this article, and it's something that I'm always working through and chewing on, it's, he says, let me quote him, In public, my dad was one of the greatest pastors of his generation. In private, my dad was the same man. That might sound like a simple sentence, but it's very difficult for us to live out. What we see here, 
or what we see on social media, right? We're often judging everyone else's best against our worst. If I can encourage you how to make the Father proud, be the same person that you are right now, here, that you are in private. It's difficult. You're not going to yell at your kids the same way, right? You'll smile. You'll give them a glare. But you might not say what you're going to say if no one else is around. But in this guy's unforgettable lessons from fatherhood, which I'll just mention briefly, uh, he said my dad was the same guy in public and private. Let me go through a few of these. I'm not going to go into too much detail. But uh, he said he was never too busy. So what I want to encourage you if, you, if you're a father figure or if you're anyone in someone's life who looks up to you, write down one or two of these. But he said my dad was never too busy. He, tells, he shares a story, but I'm going to keep going. He says my dad was a Bible man. Miss and I have tried this year more than ever to read the Bible before we go to bed, and my kids are really starting to crave that. So be a Bible man, right? Um, he says in his list, he praised God. Don't be afraid to, to worship God and show your kids how you worship God. I hope and pray that as your kids become adults, they choose to follow Christ, and they'll probably use mom or dad as an example for what they saw, right? He cheered me on. I've had a good time being my kid's biggest cheerleader. How about you? Cheer on your kids. He said he had a real walk with God. <clears throat> that was that point I kind of made in the beginning where it was the same in public and private. He shares some other ones, but then he wraps up with, with these couple. He loved us when it wasn't easy. Sometimes you got to grit your teeth and hug your kid anyways and watch what you're saying. He loved us when it wasn't easy. And last one, he helped me love the church. So this was a preacher talking about his preacher dad. I'm a preacher. I've got children. I'm thankful that these people in this room here, you know, you guys, those that are participating online, you help love my kids. Sometimes you need to, uh, as they used to do back in the old days, flick them in the back of the head. That's okay. Do what you got to do. But they come here loving church. They have friendships with people of all ages. Uh, Bill, Martin, welcome back in person. Uh, him and Ren were going back and forth. I think Ren said, was it yesterday? or sometime recently, Bill, I haven't seen you in church. When are you coming back? And here Bill is. And Bill got here before Ren, so they were kind of getting on each other. <laughs> That's important, not just for the Stivers kids, but for your kids and your grandkids. Whatever church they're at, I hope there's people that encourage them. Right? That's what this guy's talking about. So that's the, the last one that he, well, he wrote down some more, but he helped me to love the church. So be people that help others love the church. So what are the small things? Here's how we'll begin to wrap up. Uh, when a young couple waits until they're married, their work goes on the father's fridge. When an old couple keeps their promise to God and to each other, their work goes on the fridge. I like this list. When parents tackle the endless task of nurturing little ones into godly leaders and thoughtful citizens, their work goes on the fridge. These are things that make a father proud, right? When a boss treats her employees as God treats his children, her work goes on the fridge. When employees do their best, their work goes on the fridge. When volunteers show up, pitch in, help out, even when they don't want to, their work goes on the fridge. On and on and on, the list can go. Whenever you do what's right, especially when you can get away with doing what's wrong, your work goes on the fridge. That's what makes a dad proud. I've closed with this verse a few times in the last few weeks, and I think it's appropriate to do it now. So in fact, uh, as I close... Why don't we read it together? Would you, would you stand with me? So instead of a prayer, this is going to be my prayer. This is going to be our invitation if you need to have a better relationship with Christ. I want us to read, I want us to read Micah 6, 8. So I, I wrote there, live a life that honors God and through Jesus will help uh, with the help of the Holy Spirit. Let's live out these words as we close. Let's say it together. He has shown you, O mortal, what is good. And what does the Lord require of you? to act justly and to love mercy and to walk humbly with your God. You can stay standing as I invite the praise band up. The reason I included that scripture today, I went to the, is it called Heritage Days at Huntington? Is that what's going on right now? I was walking into um, a store and they sell secondhand things and there was a, a man sitting there. He's talking about his troubles in life and they started quoting Micah 6, 8 and I joined in with him. He was impressed. He was like, oh man, you know that too? And we had a moment together. Be in God's word. Immerse yourself in his word. And you don't know the amazing things that are going to happen. But live out uh, this prayer with me. That's my prayer for you.
Amen. with us today. Have a great week.